Hello and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Felipe and I'm a social skills and confidence coach. In this video, I'm interviewing a really good friend of mine from college, actually. His name is Jesse Freitas. And we talk about everything from how he went on to become part of the World Guinness Record or his company from his idea, as well as how he helped transform a company and really grow a company from 5 million all the way to 20 plus million million as a marketing director for his company. So if that interests you, if career advice interests you, networking, social skills, and that sort of thing interests you, then this episode is for you. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and check out some of my other videos. All right, enjoy the chat. I want to welcome Jesse Freitas. Jesse is one of my uh, older friends uh, since college, actually. I went to interview him because I really think he has a lot to offer when it comes to career experience, life experience, and he's a great connector when it comes to just networking, especially in the professional world. So I want to welcome you, Jesse. Thanks for uh, doing this. Thank you, Felipe. It's always good to chat with you and uh, catch up and excited, excited to be on. And hopefully we can talk about some fun things that uh, give people some insight. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I've seen you do some incredible things from, you know, do a, a world Guinness record as well as really grow a uh, sticker giant, which is what you're wearing. You're obviously not promoting it at all. <laughs> not at all. Very subtle, very subtle. Uh, but yeah, so I've learned a lot from you. I've learned a lot from your company as I've been running the wine tour. So thanks again for being here. And can you tell wh whoever's watching this, can you tell them a little bit about you and um, I guess how your journey has been since uh, we've been in college, since we had a marketing class and what your journey has evolved too. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm, I'm Jesse Freitas again, and uh, I'm the director of marketing at Sticker Giant. Um, we print custom stickers and labels. So think promotional stickers, bumper stickers that like a brand, a business would give out and, uh, and any product labels, you know, you walk a million stores and online shopping, there's labels for everything from the actual product to the boxes going out the door, especially this year of all years. So that's kind of our, our core business is, is that. And so I've uh, been pretty fortunate to be, be in this business for as long as I have six years as a mark. I wasn't sure coming out of college, Felipe, I think you could probably, a lot of people pr could probably resonate with that. Like, you know, we are bombarded as students that the career paths have changed and you're not going to be in a job for more than three years and that kind of thing. So sitting here almost six years later into a, a career and job, I, I feel very fortunate and um, it's been a, a hell of an opportunity. So um, yeah, my, my journey is uh, not, not the same as everyone's, you know, I got, I got out of high school and I was not focused. I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to party. I failed. I failed at CSU. I literally dropped out after a semester and wasted a ton of money. Um, you know, fast forward a few years, uh, Metro, Metropolitan State University of Denver is where after, after getting more work experience, I ended up there and that's where Felipe and I met and yeah, 20, 2010 was when I graduated. Um, yeah, it's been a dec decade already since, wow. since we, since we <laughs> walked, walked and did all that and had a fun party to celebrate. And um, we've both kind of ran off on our own paths and I can, I can tell you for people just looking for career advice out there, it's, it's not easy. Like, I, I know, I think you went through, you've gone through, went through similar things to me, but getting a marketing degree and hitting the market with um, the job market, I should say, mm -hmm. um, with a degree and a little bit of customer or a fair amount of customer service experience, it's hard to get a marketing job. Like most of them require two to three years. So I, it was like running straight into a brick wall and uh, Felipe will recall that you'll recall this, but for those out there, I worked at the career services office part-time as a student. So I felt like of all the people, all the students coming out, like I got the tools, I got the resume, I did the, you know, all the psychological career mapping stuff that you can do. And I felt very like focused and I could find something and I couldn't find anything. And I ended up working at the Stanley Hotel of all places, the, the haunted hotel in Estes Park, Colorado, coming out of school. And I, I literally just took a front desk job one summer. And I thought that would be all that was. 
that experience for me led to three years of being at that hotel. I met my future wife there, Hannah. Um, I had the opportunity to help on some horror film festivals. They started a Stanley Film Festival. I was up there. I got to run tour. So it was a very out of the box hospitality experience. And I, I ended up working myself into a management role there and got a little plugged in, not like officially with my title or anything, but got plugged in with helping with social media and some of the marketing elements, um, running the tour office. I got to get, you know, kind of uh, put my fingerprint on the design and how we promote that specifically within the hotel. So that was where I really started to get to cultivate and use my marketing background that we got in school. <clears throat> For those of you who know Estes Park, Colorado, it's a beautiful place, uh, but most people go during the summer. So I definitely did not want to spend all my time up in the mountains of Colorado, but you know, diff different people, different um, aspirations from that in that regard. Yeah. I think, you know, while, while we're on that note for people out there just thinking about careers and I think it's important to just call out that 2020 has been a hard for a lot of people. A lot of people are going through career change and switching jobs, trying to get educated, all these things that I'm kind of talking about. My personal experiences are job, you know, your part of your social identity is wrapped up into who, you, what you do. And I just, I just want to acknowledge that it sucks to be in that position. So I want to empathize with people out there, but also give some encouragement that these, these moments typically lend themselves to some light and some new opportunities that, that end up being more beneficial than where you're at sometimes. So I just think people need to keep their heads up because, and sometimes all it takes is saying yes to, to that kind of entry level thing and, and finding your way within a company and it can open a million doors. Um, so Never be afraid to, to start start where you can. So would you, um, if you were starting all this, uh, let's say all over again, and you are in the middle of this or something like that, first of all, what would be your mindset knowing what you know now? And what practical things would you, well, perhaps what practical steps would you take to, to begin to move forward, even if it starts at an entry level position? Yeah, if, if I went back and, I thought, you know, you think, you think you do well networking, right? Like people talk about networking and networks, but, but networks only go so far sometimes because you, you feel like within a role or a job, like, oh, I have a good network, but your network is typically surrounded by what you do. Mm -hmm. So the moment what you do changes or you want to change what you do, suddenly your network is maybe not that impactful. So Knowing what I know now, I think it's important to network and socialize with professionals outside of what you do. And, and that's not, it's actually not that hard. Um, yeah. Local chambers is a great thing. Like local business chambers, networking. I don't know about you, Felipe, but I still love going out and getting beers, you know, any, any, uh, any night or afternoon of the week, if I have an excuse to go chat with someone over a beer or a drink, um, especially supporting local businesses like local distilleries and breweries and cider, you name it. And in Longmont, Colorado, we're very fortunate. There's a ton to choose from. Um, mm -hmm. But the chamber specifically, Longmont Chamber does a lot of events at those places um, during kind of normal times, if you will. But um, I, those opportunities are good. Like they're just one area. But I think doing that, joining virtual events where you can, I know meetup.com has things, but that's where I'd really encourage people to try to spend some time, not just staring at your resume and staring at the ceiling of your house while you're on the couch, trying to figure out what is it I want to do. You, you have to go find the opportunities because I, as much as I want to do something, the opportunities aren't always there. So you got to kind of find the opportunities that are there and then cultivate it to help grow your career in a way you want to go. And then again, like they always told us in school or even now, like every three years, you might have to change your job. You know, it's, it's a thing. You join a startup, it's a little bit of a risk, right? Like you, you, you like an idea, you go for it, you learn something and sometimes it doesn't work out and you got to jump into something new. So, um, so startup communities are great too. So definitely don't take yourself so seriously when it comes to a lot of this stuff as well. I mean, it's, there's going to be ups and downs, right? Shed your ego. The reason I, I ask you this is because I remember since we were actually in college, some of the some of the professors that when we share the classes, they, they really connected very well with you and respected you quite a bit. 
I was like, holy shit, this guy is like on it. But I was always uh, amazed at how teachers really respected you as well as, you know, the kind of network that you commanded in the career center and all that sort of thing. So how do you approach maybe an event or connecting with people? How do you, how do you approach that from a, a mentality standpoint? That's a really good question. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, and you have some interesting insight into me, Felipe, too. So way to, way to put me on the spot here. But I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, and and I, I say that kind of in reference to, like, you really have to ground yourself in who you are and not try to be like that. I'll relate it back to the job candidate thing. But you can't try to be the job description you know, you, you have to be yourself. Instead of, instead of trying to fit into a mold of what they would expect you to be. That would kind of- exactly. And, and another tip, like I've done a fair amount of hiring now. So like as, a, as someone who's been a hiring manager multiple times now in my career and been fortunate to go through that versus that kind of networking and that side of it where people might find themselves, it's important to know that when, when hiring managers create a job description with your HR team, Like, it's like kind of trying to, you know, find the best match that people will resonate with. It's not exactly what a hiring manager wants, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they'll want someone to come in and actually be like, oh, yeah, all this is great. Have you thought about this, you know. So some being yourself can actually be a better fit for a job than matching the job description. And that's just kind of a reference for how I approach networking situations, Um I don't know. Like, to be honest, I'm not always like fully on my game. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's certain, I, I think it's moment to moment. And I, I, I think most people would experience me as an extrovert and I would call myself an extrovert, but I'm an extrovert who needs a lot of introvert downtime. Yeah. <laughs> a high performing gamer, right? That's what I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I like, I like gaming. Uh, I, I, I love playing games. Um, I love playing my guitar at home, but you know, and I, I, you know, I've never been like a performer per se, but I wouldn't necessarily pass up the moment if I put enough time into it. But but still, I'm more comfortable at home, you know, so mm-hmm. I kind of ebb and flow. And I think it's important for people to know you are going to ebb and flow. There's some, sometimes you're going to walk in a room and you're just going to be ready to meet and mingle with people and be kind of energetic. And there's other times it might just not feel right. So <clears throat> I just want to call that out because I'm not always like ready to go. What I remember about you and the way that you carry yourself is that you're not necessarily over the top with energy, but you're just kind of suddenly just chilled out, relaxed. I, I like the idea that you said in terms of not becoming someone else. You know, one interesting lesson I had as a younger adult was working in hotels. I, I used to work at the Hyatt Regency Denver, I think before I even met you. Yep. yep. When, I, when I first started running into celebrities, that was a... It's an interesting moment because I think a lot of people in still today, you know, there's celebrities we'd want to meet or sit with or talk to. And I remember running into celebrities and, and kind of having that like, oh, hey, like, how are you? And then like, you just have that brief interaction with a celebrity. And then it's just kind of like, oh, well, they're, like, they're literally just another human being. Like, they're just like, they're, right. they're not special. Like, they, you know, they have a skill, they have some success, right? But they're not different between you and I. And I think one of the lessons I learned in those early interactions and having quite a few of those experiences at my time at, at the Hyatt and um, was that realization I think I've carried with me a little bit. Like, it doesn't matter if like someone's an owner, CEO of a company. It doesn't matter if they're celebrity, like any room you walk into, if you're just yourself and you're just casual and just look to have a conversation and care about the people as humans and not something else like i think socializing is easier and i think a lot of times the societal dynamics and where we position people just from our initial biases is kind of what creates that sense of like ah like who who am i to be in this room talking to who am i to like you know so it's a lot of like trying to find that confidence within yourself to just to, to be okay asking a dumb question even, right? Like it's okay. Or, or someone, you know, those social circles you get in and someone references something and uh, you know, latest TV show or something, people are watching Mandalorian or whatever, and you reference it and you're the one person who has no idea. That's okay. 
Like, it's okay to be the outlier and say, I don't know what you all are talking about, but I'm glad it's funny. Like, <laughs> no, absolutely. And, you know, I'm just kind of, as you say, you know, this, I'm remembering how I've seen you, especially in college, because we spent a lot of time uh, during our college years. And I think that is, honestly, if I could put a, my finger on it, that would be the number one thing I, I believe why a lot of teachers, a lot of people that were the leaders in, in our university were uh, really connected well with you because you, you didn't have that. And I think at the time, I probably had some of that. I ha- it was something that I had to overcome with internships and trying to talk to, you know, the vice president of this company, the vice president of Chafa or, the, or president or whatever. It was something that really did um, hinder me, I think, in the beginning. But now looking back, I think that was that was one of the probably the number one thing that I saw you we're doing so well with connecting with some of these people because you just, um, I think you demystified it in your head. Yeah. Another thing I'll say related to that is anxiety is energy. Mm. So being anxious, walking into any social setting is totally normal. Like Mm. I feel it all the time, like especially depending on the dynamics. Like if you're, if you're in sales and you're having to hit a sales floor, like, there's a job performance, right? Like you have anxiety for different reasons, depending on the circumstance. And I think it's good for people to acknowledge nervousness and anxiety as just a form of energy. Acknowledge it. Yeah. I'm anxious. Yeah. yeah. As soon as you like, just stare that down and name it. It's like, Oh, okay. Then you just ball that up and just light a fuse and go. So it's. As opposed to denying it or trying to change it. Right. I mean, you're, you're at that point you're uh, you're struggling with it as opposed to just owning it right yeah, yeah. how about you felipe how do you, how do you how do you deal with uh, social settings and walking into situations I, I think the biggest thing is that i leave it all to my to my practices that i do every day from meditation uh, from just visualizing what's going to happen when i go into a coffee shop or when i go into a social setting and, and that sort of thing so I might uh, kind of, you know, just kind of think about, um, let's say, an event's coming up tonight. I might think about it and just visualize how it's going to go. Other than that, um, I warm up. I prefer to have my anxiety happen before I show up. So with people that I, if, if I'm on the, on the street, let's say it's in downtown Denver. If I'm in the street and I'm walking towards the Hyatt, <laughs> for example, uh, for an event there, I might, I might just start greeting people on the street because... I feel more comfortable with having anxiety and warming up in the street rather than at the event where my, my mindset or my mind might tell me that there's higher stakes, if you will. But there's a thing where I think it takes three or five people, talk to five people for any person to, to really feel friendly or warm up. So anxiety is normal, like you say, but for me, I would, uh, I like preparation. I'm, I'm with you there, especially depending on the set, setting. I'm a, I'd like to know as much as I can, if if I can. I know a lot of social settings, it's not, you know, it's not there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about Sticker Giant. I'm curious to hear, a, a, you know, kind of a, a summary of your journey when it comes to, you know, bringing a company that, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, from going from $5 million to $21 million plus in, uh, I believe, sales, right? Yeah, yeah, on the path to, to oh my gosh, we're going to hit almost 26 million the, at the end of this month, this year. Fast growth. Congratulations, first of all. So uh, it's, uh, not, it's not just me, trust me. <laughs> I guess to speak to some of the kind of openness and meetings and, and those things. So when I, when I joined the company in, it was 2015, John Fisher is our CEO founder. Business has been around since 2000. So we have an interesting story. He, he started with a single bumper sticker idea back in the year 2000, sold it through a Yahoo online store. Like, you know, we're, we're talking early e-commerce days. Like there's, you know, there's Amazon and Amazon was selling books. They weren't about the life they're about now, you know, like just yeah. to, hard to even reflect back on that moment. Um, so he wanted to be the sticker, the online sticker sales uh, of, of like Amazon. Uh, so yeah. the Amazon is stickers. And all, of the, all the company did was sell retail stickers for its first seven years of existence. And they got to over a million dollars in sales, just pick packing, you know, your name, your favorite sports team, political bumper stickers, you name it, you know, like, um, so that's how the business started. Then it pivoted in custom printing because small businesses, especially as 
um, I actually credit it a little bit to the online boom of you can create whatever you want today. Like that's the amazing thing. Like actually when you tell your kids, you can do whatever you want in 2020, 2021, we're almost in, it's more true than ever. You can literally build a website and sell something and sell a service product, like ship it. Like it, it's just easy, quote unquote. Um, but uh, that's kind of where Sticker Giants custom printing and who we are today came into existence. And uh, fast forward through some of the background of the, the company in 2015, when I came in, I got uh, introduced to open book management, which is uh, based on a book called The Great Game of Business by Jack Stack and Bo Burlingham. Um, really interesting business story of just making numbers transparent and bringing your employees into the financial uh, understanding of a business. So ownership thinking is another term. There's another book called that too. That's a good book to look uh, for. But that was what I was introduced to. And it was so cool because it's like, oh my goodness, like, you know, have these like closed book, end of the month meetings where you find out something didn't happen the way you thought it was going. It's like every week there's a financial rollout, at least of the top KPIs. And as employees, giants, we call them, you can, you can get as into that as you want, just understanding it from what the data is given to you. Or you can be like, you know, I'm cool over here just doing my job. And like, that's okay too in our company, but the opportunity is there to learn. And then we added in a couple years later, EOS, which is the Entrepreneurial Operating System based on a book called Traction by Gino Wickman. Uh, Gino Wickman also has a series of books related to that. And we put that system into place, which I love the L10 meeting agendas from that. Like if you just want to pluck something out of this call today or, or look that up, they have a, there's a YouTube video he has. It just explains an L10 meeting. It's the best meeting you can ever run. I can tell you that. It just puts a structure on team meetings that's helpful. And in, in, in a virtual world where we're, a lot of us are in too, I think that's probably needed now more than ever in, in a way. Um, so anyways, those are some of the things I know we brought you into some of those things. And then, uh, you know, I'm not afraid to go around talking about our marketing processes or, or what we've built over the years to be successful either, because nothing you do in business, unless you're talking about like a Apple product where they made some like chip, you know, a lot, a lot of that IP stuff, it's like anyone can go buy a printer and cut labels and stickers. Like there's a million companies out there that do it, but what we do is unique from a cultural sense. And, um, I think our brand, branding is a reflection of culture in a lot of sense. So we have a fun, fast, friendly brand because that's what we've built internally. And part of that comes from these businesses, uh, systems. Part of that comes from John's initial vision and kind of the, the wheels he put in motion very early on. And then today, like, wow, we have a full-fledged leadership team, directors, and, and we're, we're taking what we've built and we're even expanding it further because you, you can't keep doing what you did yesterday to grow so every, every day is a new challenge. Every day is something new. And, and we're business geeks. We love to talk to other small businesses. So if there's people out there, you can ping me on LinkedIn and we can schedule time. I, I, love, to, I love to put my brain into other people's businesses because it, it challenges me. Well, I think I'm going to take you up on that as I, as I pivot the, uh, the wine business as well for real time. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, I would love to hear it. I mean, I'll do, just as an example, like we're mostly B2B. So B2C marketing is still very intriguing to me. Um, right. Like the Super Bowl, I'm a huge football fan. Mm -hmm. I watch, I can never go to the bathroom because I love the commercials and I love the game. And so I'm just like sitting there eating and drinking, just like, ah, like, how do I, what do I do? Because I just, yeah, I love to follow brands and commercials and advertising. And uh, yeah. this year, especially like watching theaters, uh, like movie theaters just just fascinating to me watching the streaming wars and movie theaters and i'm just like just personally i'm just sitting back e eating popcorn at home like what are you all gonna do about this like this is crazy where do you see from from a digital marketing perspective and your experience as well where do you see a lot of these uh, practices going whether it be online businesses or or that kind of thing and, and obviously it hasn't affected sticker giant or maybe it has as much as other industries like tourism movie theaters and that sort of thing where do you see businesses and specifically online businesses evolving to from COVID? yeah well i mean i think roller coasters and a pretty accurate description to what this year has been with the pandemic and everyone's on a different ride 
Yeah. Um, some people were on the Tower of Doom. <laughs> it just went down. And that would be like movie theaters. And some of us are on like kind of the wavy roller coasters and some are spinning upside down and we're just going with it. Like we're one of those businesses that everyone in March was like, woo, because like ev the whole world, we all remember it. Like I, it was just- Everybody freaked out or is that- Yeah, well, everyone just kind of didn't know what to do. We literally didn't know what we were watching. Like one of the trending movies on, I, I think it was Apple Store or something was the movie Out Outbreak. Um, yeah. which is about a pandemic, but that pandemic was like killing everyone, like within like hours, like it was scary as hell. But uh -huh. back in March, when the news was coming out, it's like, you didn't really know what like level this disease was and, and not to, to, you know, like say it wasn't impact, like it's killed a ton of people. So I have to acknowledge that it's been awful, yeah. but from a business standpoint, everything just dived and we were fortunate and kept our processes of how we advertise and go acquire business. We left our ad campaigns across all our digital channels at the same budgets. Cause we made, we made a call and just talking with my team and our, you know, our leadership team at the beginning, I said, let's hold it because if we don't, we're not going to find people looking for us. And mm -hmm. sure enough, within three weeks, we started building back up from that fall because yeah. businesses were suddenly making hand sanitizer labels and masks and oh, wow. people, people were, people were shifting and we do, we offer a very broad product and work with every industry you can imagine. So we are fortunate as a business to be set up in a way that we're not, we're not bulletproof. Yeah. Yeah. We're not bulletproof to the economy. Cause you know, we go with the market still, but when the market changes, we can still do and pivot even better than some large label companies with the market. Um, Cause we do, we offer quick turn, short run um, work for people. So we were able to ride that out. So um, as far as what the pandemic will do, I mean, there's been obviously a huge shift to, to digital and digital acquisition. And I think companies that have pushed it and pushed it and pushed it um, have learned something. So and I think consumers have learned something too. Like if you didn't pick up groceries before or do delivery, it's like kind of a nominal fee for like a pretty big convenience. Mm -hmm. I'm someone who hates going into grocery stores to look at food though. So I've been on that, that bandwagon for a couple of years now, but I think people overreact. They, they'll say like, Oh, is this the death of brick and mortar stores? Hell no. Like people love to shop. There's still like clothes shopping is still going to be a thing thing that a lot of people are, are going to want to go do in person. It's bonding time with families, like part of holiday traditions, even if, as we get closer to Christmas right now, like people, that's something people do, you know, together. Um, and so I believe businesses, they've been forced to look at digital more and they'll continue to refine it, but there's going to be a comeback of how do I make coming to my store more experiential? Um, I do believe there's a day where like just having a store with products on the shelf is not going to cut it. Like you, you're going to have to adapt or bring in augmented reality or some sort of the online to being in store. Like, you know, Home Depot and stuff's already done it. You got the app and you can run around and find what you need, you know? So stores have already started doing this pre pandemic, but I'll, I'll use theaters as a reference, like depending who owns movie theaters at the end of, everything happening um i believe movie theaters will have to take that alamo draft house the cinnabar there's theaters out there that were already making an experiential and i believe drive-in movie theaters will also come back in a sense like they i think there's a a, a market for that now because there's gonna be people more worried about germs more cautious on what they do and drive-in theaters is a great way to offer people a safe alternative to movie theaters, but still right. have the experience. So, you know, I don't, it's hard to put a, you know, a crystal ball in front of us and predict, but my guess is the two are going to blend and, and consumers are going to ask companies to do more in the physical locations and, and rest. I, I still wonder about restaurants, right? Like they're so packed in. Like you, you go in some of these restaurants that you love and they're so tight and you used to get your shoulder knocked and stuff. And I'm like, 
I get like you, you're limited by space. So what are we going to do? Are we going to be just sitting back at the bar, getting our shoulder knocked by servers, or are they going to start making bigger restaurants more spread out so people feel more comfortable? Like, I have questions on my mind about that, but no, that's uh, that's uh, that's a good point. I mean, thinking about it, you know, I'm not necessarily in the restaurant industry, but definitely in experienced tourism and that sort of thing. I wonder if that's going to shift as well into creating more exclusive experiences, exclusive meaning private for specific groups as they think they're kind of doing right now. I mean, obviously we're close in Colorado, but I wonder if that's going to be tailored towards that more high end, you know, exclusive experiences. Uh, I wonder if that's going to happen. And, um, but yeah, I also agree. I mean, I think, I think the whole digital thing is going to, is going to be a must for, for a lot of companies and especially if they are in the industries that have been hit so hard currently. So, but yeah, no, now I want to hear about something uh, that I find really fascinating. And, and it's funny because um, when I first heard about this, uh, I, it was just very shocking. You, you are either you or your company or was your idea. Um, you're in the world Guinness records, right? Uh, yes. And actually we, we are, we were, we, we, (laughs) someone just beat our record last month, Felipe. So you're, you're hitting me in a a personal spot, but yeah, in 2016, um, as sticker giant, I I came up with the idea to register national sticker day because there's all these national days. There wasn't one for stickers, which just felt almost like completely wrong. Like what is wrong with the world to not celebrate (laughs) stickers, right? Like we all love them. Yeah. Um, so we, in creating this day, we set a Guinness world record for the largest ball of stickers. Um, Saul is his, is his designated name, Saul, the largest sticker ball. And, uh, he's been part of sticker giant since 2016 when we set the record. And he actually technically is still the largest sticker ball. The folks who just, uh, beat our record are actually in for a surprise when we drop them on a scale, take a photo and send it to Guinness. So we're coming back for our record soon. So that's awesome, man. What, yeah. It, what inspired the idea for you, man? Were you just like, was it uh, late night drinking or? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's like really, that's no, incredible, man. No, uh, it no. was, you, you know what it was? It was that if anyone's been in charge of social media accounts or even as a brand tried to sit there and be like, what am I going to post every day and talk about? Well, I used to go chasing national days because we'd print stickers of all kinds of things in the shop. So I was very, I was very attuned to national days. And so it just, the thought just crossed my mind, like when is national sticker day? We need to do something for that. And there was nothing. So that's kind of what started my line of thinking. And then um, pop culture reference. I love Anchorman. Um, he, he has that segment in whatever part of the movie where it's the cat fashion show. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, aren't they adorable? And like, that's the closing section segment of the news. Yeah. And it's so true. Cause even if you watch the local news tonight, I dare you, if you're watching or someone out there, watch it, there's usually a fluffy piece at the end. And so when I threw out the idea, actually our owner shut me down initially, it took six yeah. months for me to actually get him to approve this. So I had to do national sticker day. Then I came up with this record and then I, th- was like, listen, all this media, earned media we could get out of doing this, if it hit the end of a news segment, it's just great. Like who else is gonna talk about a manufacturer just printing stickers and labels? And it worked. (laughs) This is a crazy thing. Like I thought it would be a soft, like, you know, local news. And we got on the local news, we were on there, we did a whole thing, but actually, ironically, we ended up at MSU Denver campus to film a segment with ABC and Now. And, um that segment went national to 14 major U.S. markets for the evening news um, where they interviewed John Fisher. And um, during that day of our appearance in the Nine News studio, then the ABC and the Now, we did another, I think it was the, the just the Spanish version of Nine News, if I'm recalling right. Oh, really? um, they walked downtown Denver with us and we did an interview with them too. Wow. And by nighttime, Late Night with Seth Meyers made fun of us. No shit. Uh, yeah, he did not say sticker giant, which kind of like was like the zinger right. there, like, ah, come on, Seth. But he, he mentioned a group in Colorado and he made a pot joke because, you know, of course, marijuana is legal in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, a uh, classic late night. But but yeah. anyway, that was like the big culmination. And then nine months later, Guinness came out, did a photo shoot and a video of their own. And we actually made the book 
which I didn't know how big of a deal that was at the time because I think it's like something like 55,000 records were set that year um, and only 4,000 actually get in the book, something like that. Wow. Um, and so that kind of blew me away. And then Guinness does their whole release of the book and we were like the featured record. So we were on like Mashable and like all this stuff. So we circulated again like a year later in the news and it was just crazy. So, so since then we've- It wasn't your intention to get on that book. It just began to, began to evolve as um, as you got featured in different news or did you intentionally- Oh yeah. I, I mean, everyone knows what a Guinness World Record is just kind of, you hear about them, right? Like they're in the yeah. news cycle and there's a book and as a kid, you look at the book. So I knew, a, but I didn't know what the process was. And it was actually kind of, you know, pretty strict for what you got to jump, the hoops you got to jump through to get it. But then I had no idea. Like, I honestly thought it would be a local news soft segment, you know, some fun and we'd move on. And right, right, right. it's been interesting though, just as a, as me, as me myself, like not sticker giant, watching national sticker day take off because that's not something you're branded. It's not something you own. You just create it and put it out in the world. Mm -hmm. And that has gotten so much traction that we're seeing like the Pixar's and Marvel's and Disney's like, you know, the huge umbrella there celebrating it on social on that day. No so like for me personally, I look at like just the impact of that national day. I have a lot of, I have a lot of pride in that. And it's kind of a goofy thing. Like national days are just a little weird, but it's still cool to, to see brands embrace and celebrate that. It's something that goes beyond my impact at Sticker Giant and uh, wow. something. It's cool. No, that's crazy, man. I mean, I don't know. I, that's why I was like, what, that, that was so out of the box in terms of uh, that idea. I mean, even, even pitching it to, uh, to John, would, I mean, it sounds like a crazy I, idea. I mean, I, I don't blame him for turning it down, but wow, it was brilliant, man. My biggest thing since then, like he's on Roadside America. We were doing tours prior to kind of having to shut down our facility to the public this year, but um, uh, he's been, he parades and goes to events with us. We've taken him to trade shows and I'm telling you, dropping like an almost 400 pound sticker ball on a trade show floor next to your table is like the biggest attention grabber in the world. And uh, if anyone wants to look it up, Saul's Excellent Adventure. We actually road tripped with him in a van all the way to California for Social Media Marketing World just two years ago. I, sticker ball logistics is a real thing. It was a lot of planning and so much work to drag that 400 pound ball around. And I could tell you my shoulders are tired from pushing them off and on a wagon over the years. So yeah, dude. Well, thanks again for for being a part of this. It's been incredible to catch up with you. I know. Yeah, you've you've been off running all over the world till this year. So yeah, good to chat with you, Felipe. I mean, I just you know encourage everyone out there, especially if you're going through a tough time, keep your head held high, be true to yourself, and and you will find your way.